Hello and welcome to the Complete History of Science podcast. Until fairly recently, the history of astronomy, and by extension the history of science, was considered to have begun in ancient Greece. Babylonian astronomical texts, written in cuneiform, were only beginning to be deciphered in the late 19th and early 20th century, and our understanding of their sophisticated astronomical observations came fairly late. In contrast, Greek works have been read and thought about throughout the entire history of science, having been copied and handed down throughout the Middle Ages until the present day. Indeed, most of the discoveries in the history of science have either grown out of those made by the Greeks, or were seen as being in opposition to Greek thought. While the Babylonians may have a claim to being the first culture to make a meaningful contribution to the history of science, it's the Greeks who will undoubtedly be the more influential in the development of science in the West. Early Greek astronomy was conceptually very different to what was being practiced by the Babylonians, whereas the Babylonians carefully recorded observations of the night sky over many generations, the early Greeks weren't interested in collecting empirical data. Instead, the Greeks engaged in qualitative and often very speculative descriptions of the celestial bodies. While the Babylonians, as far as we know, had no model or picture underlying their observations, the Greeks were wholly consumed in debating the nature of the skies and the heavens. There are a couple of likely reasons for this, and they both concern the different makeup of Greek society and the intellectual traditions which led to the founding of Greek astronomy. The Greeks, unlike the Babylonians, didn't live in a large centralised empire, but in numerous smaller city-states. Beginning in around the 8th century BC, these Greek city-states began to expand around the Mediterranean, creating colonies as far afield as Spain, Italy, Egypt, and across Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. In fact, many of the most important figures in so-called Greek science never would have set foot in mainland Greece. Instead, they lived in one of the many colonies. Importantly, there was no unified organisation between these colonies, and instead, they were only loosely united by language and culture. And it's Greek culture which was so incredibly important in the development of science in the West. The Greeks created a vibrant intellectual life which spread around the Mediterranean and would go on to greatly influence the Romans and by extension, all of the Western world. Whereas Babylonian science was a consequence of the powerful state funding their astronomical endeavours, Greek science grew out of their intellectual interests. These interests were varied but they were especially keen on literature and philosophy, and it can be argued that Greek astronomy has its roots in these earlier traditions. For example, in literature, as far back as Homer in the 8th century BC, Greek poets had included detailed references to the stars, constellations, and their motion across the sky. The later writer Hesiod discussed the rising and falling of constellations in time with the seasons, similar to those that were included in the Babylonian Moapin tablets discussed in the last episode. However, Greek science really has its roots in Greek philosophy, which is usually considered to start with the pre-Socratic philosophers Thales, Anaximander and Heraclitus, who lived around the 6th century BC. These philosophers were primarily interested in the natural world and above all in deducing causes. Whereas earlier writers such as Hesiod had discussed the cosmos in terms of gods who made and controlled events, the pre-Socratic philosophers moved towards the view that events were a product of natural forces and rejected the possibility of gods intervening in the world. To modern ears, the theories of these early philosophers may now seem rather strange. Thales, for example, thought that water was the fundamental element and the earth floated on endless sea whereas by contrast, Heraclitus argued that everything was made of fire. However, despite this, their determination to seek out rational explanations for the world would have a huge impact on future Greek thinkers. Among these thinkers was Anaxagoras, 
who lived in Athens in the 5th century BC. Anaxagoras was a bold thinker who argued that the so-called heavenly bodies, that is the sun, moon and planets, were made of the same ordinary matter found on earth. This was important as it countered the dominant religious thought of the time. The Greeks, the Babylonians, as well as many other cultures around the Mediterranean, believed the planets were literally gods, or at least representations of gods. Anaxagora suggested that the sun was in fact a red-hot rock or metal, and the moon was also made of earthly materials. While he had no direct evidence for these claims, he'll go down as one of the first martyrs for science, as he was willing to maintain this stance, even as he was tried and exiled from Athens. Anaxagoras was also the first to correctly explain the phases of the moon. Earlier thinkers had assumed that the moon emitted its own light. However, this meant they had to concoct elaborate explanations to describe the phases of the moon, arguing, for example, that only half the moon emitted light, while the other half was dark. Anaxagoras instead proposed it would be much simpler to suppose the moon was reflecting light from the sun, and the phases of the moon represent the appearances of a spherical body, illuminated at different angles. Likewise, he was also able to explain lunar eclipses, as they would occur when the Earth blocks the illumination of the moon by the sun. By giving up the idea that celestial bodies were divine, Anaxagoras discovered it was much easier to explain our observations. However, undoubtedly the most influential philosopher in the development of science was Aristotle. Aristotle's interests were incredibly diverse, writing on everything from moral philosophy to the natural world and logic, and much of his work became received wisdom in the later medieval world and throughout the Renaissance. We'll undoubtedly return to Aristotle frequently throughout the podcast, as there are few areas of science in which he didn't have some opinion. In astronomy, Aristotle believed the Earth is at the centre of the universe, and the celestial bodies orbit the Earth in circular paths, what we now call the geocentric model. Although we are often very dismissive of early thinkers who subscribe to the geocentric model, it's inarguably based on observation. The Sun really does appear to be moving across the sky while the Earth stands still. Aristotle's idea was that the Earth was fixed, and it fit with his larger philosophical ideas, which were that the heavens were static and changeless. Aristotle, unlike Anaxagoras, argued that the heavenly bodies were made of some otherworldly substance, which he called ether, and unlike the elements on Earth, ether wasn't prone to change or decay. The idea of an unchanging heaven would be incredibly influential, and led, over the centuries, to many astronomical observations being dismissed when they didn't fit with Aristotle's idea. It wasn't until the 16th century, when the world was on the cusp of scientific revolution, that Tycho Brahe's observation of a new star made people start to consider that Aristotle may be wrong. Much of Aristotle's thought derived from that of another early Greek thinker, Eudoxus of Cnidus. Eudoxus was primarily a mathematician who made huge contributions to mathematics. His work, especially in geometry, was incredibly influential, forming a large part of Euclid's Elements, the most important mathematical work of antiquity. Eudoxus was himself influenced by the Pythagorean school, but was an important figure in moving Greek mathematics away from numbers and arithmetic, which had obsessed the Pythagoreans, towards pure geometry. However, most importantly in the history of science, he was probably the first person to present a geometrical conception of the universe, and attempt to use it to explain the motion of the sun, moon and stars. Eudoxus knew from the Pythagoreans that the Earth was a sphere, and in his model he placed it at the centre, unmoving. He then imagined that the celestial bodies, that is the sun, moon and stars, were attached to rotating spheres. For example, the sun rotated around the Earth once every 24 hours, giving us day and night. Eudoxus then added additional spheres to try and account for other phenomena. For example, the sun needs an additional sphere to account for the slower annual motions of the sun across the sky 
which give rise to the seasons. To model this, Eudoxus imagined another great circle around the Earth, called the ecliptic. The circle is centred at the Earth, but it's at an angle of 23.5 degrees with respect to the Earth. As well as the daily rotation across the sky, the Sun makes a yearly west to east rotation across this great circle, which accounts for the Sun being at its highest point in the summer and lowest in the winter. In fact, most of the celestial bodies, including the Moon, the constellations, and even the planets, seem to make their way across this ecliptic at varying rates. If you look into the night sky, the Moon and the planets can often be seen to be aligned along this great line. I advise downloading and using Google Sky Map, and observe the night sky for yourself to see this. The line, of course, is somewhat illusory. It results from the fact that the Earth and other planets all orbit in roughly the same plane, but the Earth is tilted on its axis. The ancient Greeks, of course, didn't know this, and so attached much significance to the ecliptic. To account for all the known motion, Eudoxus's model had to become incredibly complex, and eventually included 27 different spheres, including three for the Sun and Moon, four for each of the known planets, and one for the stars. In reality, however, Eudoxus's model doesn't do a great job of explaining all of the observed motion. For example, as discussed in the last episode, it was already well known to the Babylonians that in the Sun's apparent orbit, the time between solstices and equinoxes varies. In 432 BC, two Athenian astronomers, Meton and Euctemon, had measured these periods as 90 days, 92 days, 93 days, and then finally 90 days. Eudoxus' model, however, assumes the Sun travels at a constant speed in a circular orbit, which would imply that these periods between the solstices and the equinoxes should be equal. Nevertheless, this doesn't seem to have troubled him. That's because to the Greeks at this time, very little effort was made to compare these mathematical and geometrical models to real data. This did set them apart from the Babylonians, who had been primarily interested in observation and prediction. It took several centuries, but eventually Greek astronomy, through the work of Aristarchus, Hipparchus, and Ptolemy, would combine these two approaches and put astronomy on more sound scientific footing. Nevertheless, Eudoxus and Aristotle's geocentric model of the universe would never be fully abandoned by their successors, and it wasn't until fairly modern times that it was finally discarded. However, it's interesting that in this very early period, it wasn't a foregone conclusion the geocentric model would win out. In fact, there were many people willing to entertain alternative ideas. For example, Philolaeus, a Pythagorean philosopher working a generation before Eudoxus, had suggested that the Earth may not be at the centre of the universe, but instead there was something he called the central fire, by which he may or may not have meant the sun. This was followed by Heraclides of Pontus, a rough contemporary of Aristotle, who pointed out that the daily rotation of the celestial bodies, that is the sun, moon and stars, could equally be explained by the motion of the Earth on its axis. The Greeks, in fact, seem to understand this idea of relative motion reasonably well, and it's perhaps surprising that most thinkers were very dismissive of the idea when it came to applying it to the motion of the celestial bodies. Heraclides also may have argued that the planets orbited the Sun, which in turn orbited the Earth, an idea that was taken up again by Tycho Brahe in the 16th century. However, even more remarkable than Heraclides was Aristarchus of Samos, who maintained not only the rotation of the Earth, but also that the Sun was at the centre of the solar system, what we now call the heliocentric model. Unfortunately, Aristarchus's work on this subject has been lost, surviving only as a reference in the work of Archimedes, so we'll never know how fully developed his ideas were. Nevertheless, these passing references to Aristarchus are some of the most intriguing in the history of science, and demonstrate how diverse astronomical ideas were at the time, even when they had little influence on proceeding thought. In all, 
The impression this leaves us is that Greek thinkers in this early period were open-minded, inquisitive, and frequently correct, even if their methods were less than rigorous. By contrast, in the period which followed, Greek astronomy did evolve and become more scientific, but it also became somewhat stuck, especially with regard to the geocentric model. This caused many problems for the great Greek astronomers who followed, such as Hipparchus and Ptolemy, as they attempted to make their increasingly detailed observations fit into a geocentric model. Ptolemy's most famous work, the Almagest, would become the most important work of astronomy in the ancient world, and arguably the most influential scientific work of the period. However, the Almagest, despite, or maybe because of its success, would also have a negative effect on the development of astronomy. Astronomy would get stuck with the idea of the geocentric model, and it proved to be one of the most difficult ideas to shake off in the whole history of science, only being put to bed some 1500 years after Ptolemy's time. However, we may be getting a bit ahead of ourselves. In the next episode, we'll take a bit of a detour to look at the achievements of two of the greatest scientists of the ancient world, Eratosthenes, who used a stick to measure the Earth, and Aristarchus, who measured the distance to the Sun and the Moon. (laughs) 